My name is Faye Wolf, and today is 9-26-18. I am interviewing Nancy Jacobson at the Max M. Fisher Federation Building in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This interview is being recorded as part of the Women in Leadership Oral History Project. Do you give permission to the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriately by the archives? Yes, I do. The Women's Philanthropy Department of the Jewish Federation has had several names throughout its history, including Women's Division and Women's Campaign and Education Department. For the purposes of this interview, the, questions, the questions will refer to it by its current name, Women's Philanthropy, but you may use whatever name you're comfortable with. Okay, let's start with basic questions about you. When and where were you born? Well, I was born in Benton Harbor, which is in the southwestern part of the state. And um, I grew up there, and uh, um, it was a lovely childhood, I will say that. But you had to work very hard to be Jewish because it was such a small Jewish community. And uh, being Jewish, Jewishness meant a great deal to me. Did, where did you go to school? I went to Benton Harbor High School, graduated, and then went on to Michigan State. Um, it was a wonderful experience there. I loved my college years. I, I, um, af after I went, I, well, actually, while I was there, I majored in English literature, and then once I graduated and was married, I, I was in Pittsburgh, and taught um, high school junior and senior English at a school in Pittsburgh, and then after my husband graduated, we came back to Detroit and I taught at for two years at Don Darrow High School. <laughs> Which is in Royal Oak, correct? Which is in Royal or Oak, was correct. In Royal Oak. Okay. Um, as a child, how was religion observed in your household, especially related to being such a small community, Jewish community? Well, Judaism and Jewishness was very important. There's no question about it. You know, uh, my father had come from Liverpool. In fact, he came along with uh, Ben Barry, who was the younger brother of one of our uh, local philanthropists and financier, Lou Barry. Uh, maybe some of you know that name. Anyway, uh, my father came to Detroit and could not get a job. He was a designing engineer um, and um, actually changed our name from um, Greenberg to Jacobson. And um, I mean, pardon me to Davis, and um, um, then he was able to get a job in Benton Harbor where he became the uh, chief engineer at Ross Carrier Company, a company that became Clark Equipment, um, a big company uh, now today on the New York Stock Exchange. But um, when I grew up, he uh, and my, my parents married in Benton Harbor, and so to relate back to the question, we had a very Jewish home. Um, my father, mother, and six other couples started a reform temple. So we were very active in that reform temple. It was obviously the whole community had maybe a hundred families. So out of that, there were a number who joined the temple. And my, my parents were very, you know, were very active there. So it meant a lot to me. And why did your father change his name from Greenberg to Davis? In order to get a job. So because of anti-Semitism. Because of anti-Semitism, yeah. And how old were you? Do well, you or were you? Were well, you, when he he did that, he uh, changed his name before my parents were married. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was philanthropy important to your family? It was very important. My my mother was active in Hadassah and the uh, Temple Sisterhood, and um, um, really one thing that always caught my attention was that my father. Um, was more on the sidelines, but because he he was involved with uh, these steam shovels, which he designed, that I still see on the road, incidentally, but when he was involved with that, um, he and one of the local uh, Benton Harbor financiers um, sponsored a um, steam shovel to be sent to Israel and uh, to be sent to one of the kibbutzim. So it was a very exciting time. I remember the newspaper articles about it, and it was very meaningful to all of our family. Um, 
I think that, well, one little anecdote uh, go, that goes along with that is that my husband has a cousin, Benjamin, and Benjamin said that he was sure that that, that, that steam shovel landed in, in his kibbutz. So a <laughs> little bit of family <laughs> folklore. <laughs> Were you active in any organizations besides Federation? Yes, I, um, I was active in JARC. Um, oh, years and years ago, um, Michael Feldman, who was the incoming president of JARC, asked me if I would serve on the board because they were in the midst of making the organization, uh, turning it from a family organization to a community organization. And uh, he wanted community people, not just family members. So I was involved with that, and I, I served as the concert chair for two years, which was quite an experience. We raised uh, over a half a million dollars, and that was you know, quite an exciting time for JARC. And then um, after, after that, I became vice president of JARC. And I, I didn't continue because I felt the issues were so complex that they really needed an attorney as president. So I stopped right there. Then I was involved with um, 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 Weitzman Institute. And if you're familiar, if anybody's familiar with Weitzman, it is the, um, the academy in Israel. Very, very um, uh, prestigious. And I was very thrilled. To, my husband was involved in the early years. And then later on, I became uh, the Midwest chair of Weitzman. And that was an interesting thing to me because at that time we had, um, oh, we'd have fundraisers, we'd have s scientists coming in, we'd honor people who were uh, committed to the organization, and it was a, it was lovely. Uh, subsequent to that, the um, uh, the issues changed. In other words, Weizmann is a very successful organization worldwide. It's a, I mean, the research that's done is phenomenal, but I think that they found that they really didn't need to have all these programs. And so they just solicit the very wealthy with, with um, intentions of, of having major and receiving major gifts. And when I contrast that to Federation, I love the approach of Federation where everyone's involved, everyone has a place. There's, to me, that's, that's the beauty and that's what keeps, that's what keeps it alive, you know. And I think for me that, that I really made a decision that I, 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 I think that Federation is so important and what it does and achieves is, is just incredible. Perfect segue, but let's just go back for a little bit of a timeline for me. When okay. did you start with JARC? Like, oh, uh, that, was, an idea? that was in the 70s, you know, I've okay. been active. Okay. And then, then I went from... on to Israel Bonds. Oh my gosh, I've been involved with Israel Bonds. Okay. And loved that always and, and was honored by Israel Bonds. Was that before or after the Weizmann Institute? Uh, well, actually, before, okay. but pretty much simultaneously. Okay. And then I was on several of the boards, the Federation boards, the Jewish um, um, Family Service and the uh, um, Fresh Air Society and um, Jewish Home for the Age. Now I know that senior living, it's changed now, but it was a wonderful time. I worked with Carol Rosenberg, and, and, and that was quite something. So. When did you first become involved with Federation? <laughs> well, I first became involved with Federation. My son is 52 now, and uh, I was pregnant with him. And uh, I remember getting phone calls from one of the gals. In fact, her name was uh, Diane Schechter. And Diane Schechter um, moved and made Aliyah to Israel. But she would call me and pretty much drag me off the couch to go to communities. What was her position? I don't know that she she may have she might have been vice president. She had a position, but okay. she uh, was an activist, no question about it. And I would go to these. Uh, they were little teas in the afternoon where they would have leadership talk about all the things that Federation is doing, and and I was very excited and impressed with it. And and do you remember the type of activities that influenced you? Well, let's see. The first was the we call it the communities. And that was um, um, the little afternoon get-togethers for the women. And, you know, there were shared experiences and shared goals, and, and it was a it was a lovely time. There was institute, and there was uh, um, you know leadership program. There was just no there was no end to the activities. I mean, you could really get involved. 
And that was your son, that was when your son was obviously Was young. young, it started when I was young. So was he your first born? I have two, I have two sons. The okay. second son two years later, David. Okay. So was your husband involved in Federation also? Yes, yeah, my husband um, um, was chair of the uh, dental division at, at that early time. Um, I think that we shared so many wonderful experiences um, and, and I, I feel that I, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about some of the missions and some of the experiences that we had because we went on the first miracle mission and that was under the leadership of David Hermelin and it was such a wonderful enlightening experience, so much information and such a bonding with Israel. I remember marching in the streets of Israel carrying placards that we are, we are with you, we are, you know, we are one. That was a, a great time. Then I remember, um, well, a couple of years after that, in the very early 90s, um, our, our sons were in high school and uh, there, were a small, there was a small group, um, several families from Detroit. It was the Bormans and the, uh, um, um, let's see, Partridges and, and the Shermans, and we went as part of the uh, um, society for the um, um, Big, oh, the major, oh, the major campaign, and um, we went to all the sites, and it was really a leadership. We met with the prime minister, and we met with uh, all of the leading, you know, uh, uh, diplomats. And um, I was very, I was very touched with that experience. And I think the thing that was so important to me was not just my husband, but with our children, because they were there in the last evening they uh, made their pledges and I think my husband and I just looked at each other awestruck that our kids were that our kids were doing this and we had a telephone call about a, oh, a month later that someone from the national office wanted to videotape them and put them in a in a in one of the videos for the uh, you know national publication so that was that was very sweet but I think that our whole family felt that one of the things I I wanted to talk about because I think that missions are just the most important thing for a sense of, of uh, togetherness and commitment to Israel and to the you know to the community. It's it was so they were so important to me. But we um, we had the experience of going to Czechoslovakia and going to Czechoslovakia. Um, we were under the auspices of Ily Wiesel and Ily Wiesel. Um, and we had a man by the name of Mark Talisman who organized the, uh, the entire uh, trip. And when we were there, um, we of course visited Terezin, and that's, that's heart-wrenching as it is. And then we went on to um, go into one of the synagogues which Hitler had turned into um, a museum for the dead Jewish race, that's what he called it the extinct Jewish race. And while we were in this museum, we walked around and there were bushel baskets, just bushel baskets filled with Torah pointers and kippahs and mezuzahs and Seder plates. These were all things that Hitler was gonna put on exhibition because he had conquered the Jewish people. And it was very, it was very much of a mixed bag because you felt as if you felt the sadness of it, and yet the triumph of having survived that. So to me, uh, I mean, it's like it was just a moment. It was just a moment in time. So we went on uh, from that. Um, uh, we, you know, we came um, we came home, and one little thing that happened I'll never forget. Um, I was at the uh, my husband and I were at the airport in New York changing flights and uh, Henry Kissinger was there. I guess he'd just written a book on China and there were four or five Asian boys who were standing waiting for um, you know, a chance to get his autograph. And of course uh, Joey and Nancy uh, Kissinger were off getting the suitcases and there I was talking to uh, Henry Kissinger. Well once I said that I was on the uh, part of the exhibition and, and having gone as part of the Precious Legacy, he had a million questions for me. So I think that that was a moment in time when when does Henry Kissinger ask you questions kind of thing. And he was so interested because once he heard the name Ellie Wiesel, he wanted to know all about it. And when was that? 
mission. That was in the uh, early 90s. That, that mission was in the news. But that, with that mission, and it turned into something else, because with that mission, um, the articles were put on display, and we had a very, very uh, wonderful exhibition. It was called The Precious Legacy. It was a Federation event that uh, was very, it was a whole community event, and it was really um, um, quite amazing. And then, I, oh, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, then after that, um, our synagogue, Beth Am, um, had burned to the ground. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it had burned. And we, as part of the Precious Legacy, uh, my husband and I with our boys had gone to England to the Westminster Synagogue. And at the Westminster Synagogue, they housed all the Holocaust Torahs. So we selected a Torah um, and actually with the scribes worked on it and could not make it holy because there were just too, it had been just too uh, desecrated from the um, Holocaust. So we brought that back and as the synagogue was out of the flames, so was the Torah. So both had survived, so it was very meaningful. And that was in addition to the, uh, also a community event that uh, uh, my husband and I shared that we brought that uh, Torah back and the synagogue survived and we had a wonderful cantata and just a beautiful evening. So those were highlights in the community. And is that the Torah that's on display in At, the sanctuary? Yes, it is. Uh -huh. Yes, it is. Are you a member of Beth Am? I am. I'm on the board. Oh, board I see. Member. Well, then you know about it. Mm -hmm. You know how meaningful it was to us. So clearly your family was very supportive of your work in, Absolutely, in yeah. Federation. Uh -huh. So there was never a conflict, never a time, I mean, it can be no. very time consuming. In fact, uh, I was on the Board of Governors for a number of years and uh, for a period of time, my younger son, uh, David, was on the board at the same time. So I thought that was pretty wonderful. <laughs> That, that's actually the first person I've heard that it made a family event. <laughs> right. Family, yeah, okay. Um, just to get a little bit of a timeline, I'm not sure if you were involved in this or not, but traditionally, women's philanthropy had programs aimed at educating women and training them to be leaders. Mm -hmm. Was that there during the time that you were active with Federation, and did yeah. you participate? Oh, sure. There were always leadership training. We, we had... Uh, um, well, there were different things, but, but we had, um, as part of the campaign, we would have mock um, solicitations. And uh, we would, just to create a, a comfort zone for the women, um, we would have let them go through the whole experience of, so, of a solicitation. Because I think that that is something that's, you know, that, that would make the women, it would give them a comfort zone. Um. In women's philanthropy, what positions did you hold, and do you remember when? Because I don't know. I'm going to tell you. I do not remember the years because it was a continuum. The first thing I ever did was publicity for Institute. I was very involved in Institute, and I remember one experience. And I think that, that you can learn a lot from a negative experience because the chair, who was a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, had asked uh, me to do so many different things for the publicity and I called radio stations and I put announcements in store windows and I sent um, information to the synagogue so I felt I had just done the job and she kept asking me to do more and more and I realized at that time I had to stop but it taught me a lesson it said that you when you do uh, ask for your leadership to do things you have to just know when to stop and let them act on their own and do the best job they can because I think otherwise it, it becomes it can turn into a negative all too easily. Okay. So tell me more about the positions that you had. Oh, Just, okay. And then is, I yes, then I went on. I mean I've I I shared so many different things in terms of uh, uh, long range planning and endowments. Um, I was active in that. And and then through the years I when I got into um, um, and it was a simultaneous thing because you would work in education and at the same time work in campaign. And I started out, um, there's kind of a, a pyramid, you know, you, first you'd be a worker and then you might be asked to become a vice chair. And then after that, that would mean you would be overseeing the workers. And I served that purpose and then I was campaign chair uh, for the major gifts. 
and I worked with a woman, a Babs Lowenstein, who was just delightful, and I thought, okay, she's older and she's known in the community, and I'll do the grunt work. And it turned out that we just developed a wonderful friendship, and she was right there doing the work right along with me, so we accomplished a lot. Then later on, I, uh, I, I once again uh, chaired the uh, Lion of Judah, I shared that twice as, uh, you know, as the... Uh, Explain what the Lion of Judah okay, is. Okay, I'll tell you about the Lion of Judah because I think it's really an important thing. Years ago, I think it was in the early, very early 90s, um, uh, my close friend who was the um, national uh, president for the Women's National uh, Federation, and she happened to be telling me all about the Lion of Judah pin and that it was such a successful thing and in Baltimore where she was from they had raised more dollars than she ever expected to raise because women were anxious to join the Lion of Judah. So I, um, it was time and the announcements were coming out about it and Diane Klein and I felt that we uh, thought this was a very important um, um, program to institute for our women. And we had a meeting and surprisingly, there were a number of women who did not want the pin. So this, not that this was a fight, but it was an education because they felt it was ostentatious. It was like you were wearing dollar bills on your, on your shoulder, you know, and, and so we had to convince them. So because of that, Federation was not, our Federation was not the first Lion of Judah, but uh, um, eventually all the women accepted the idea and it, did. It worked wonders. The level increased, the level of giving just increased dramatically because of the uh, a lion pin. So the pin was awarded to women who who raised a certain amount of money? Or no, who that gave would be a who gave a certain amount of money. Yeah. And their division, there's like a, um, um, there's the lion, which is 5,000, and the um, um, ruby, which is 10, and the emerald which is 25. And one time I had, my husband and I had gone to uh, Argentina on a mission. And that's a whole other story which I'd like to relate. But in the meantime, when we were there, there was a woman with a white gold pin. And I thought, oh gee, I think I'd like that white gold pin instead. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that was $100,000. <laughs> so that was a little out of budget. But in the meantime... I'm sure you would have liked to have given me <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, you say that because uh, one of the first meetings that I attended, I remember, and it was a meeting where uh, I was giving a hundred dollars, and I was just thrilled to be doing that. And there was kind of a shill at that meeting, and all these memories are just coming flooding back to me. But I remember that Jean Frankel, and she was a well, you know, she and her husband were well-known community people, and she was giving a very large pledge, and this, uh, and she talked about it. And uh, I remember some of, the, some of the girls were saying, oh, how could they do that? We're giving, that makes us feel so badly that we're giving so little. And I felt just the opposite. I felt, you know, subliminally, this was like a goal. Maybe I wouldn't be able to do that, but I would sure like to be able to give the best gift that I could. So it, it, for me, it was a positive, and I, I was glad that Federation had her do that. So how long from the time that you tried to get the Lion of Judah pen Instituted. How long before it was accepted? It oh, like it, was it was within the year. And oh. now I think there's something like 400 women who have who are Lion of Judas now. Do they still have that program? Oh yes, very actively. In fact, we had a major fundraiser, and and it's it's you know look at women can join for different reasons. Some women you know just want the pin, so they push themselves to to raise their pledge to that level. Others just feel it in their heart, and they're they. Uh, can wear their pin. You can wear the pin every day. I mean, there's no question. Um, frankly, I wear it when I have something official going on for Federation. That's when I wear it. But, but it means a lot to me, and it means um, now my my daughter-in-laws are lions, and I think that's you know makes it uh, doubly special. And then there's the endowment. There's a little flame on it, which after you've endowed your your pin permanently, then that goes on as part of the pin. <laughs> So this is an international design. It's an inter oh yes, uh huh, it is. Okay. Okay. Um, so tell me about what inspired you to work your way up to campaign chair. And before we do that, I have a note here that you started out 
um, volunteering with teaching Russian immigrants I English? did do that for a number of years, yeah. Yeah. So is that how you started, or is that no? Well, that, that was, was just well one after? facet of it. Yeah, that was. And was one it facet. just because it was a need, and you had the skills? It's yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and it was, um, it wasn't, it was a program that really taught basic conversation to the Russians, so that they could, you know, learn how to go to the bank, learn how to just function in society, how to go to the grocery store. It was a wonderful program. I mean, it. it um, uh, I think was very helpful to all of the uh, newcomers. That was after the first wave of the Russian immigrants. You know, it worked. Uh, okay, so what inspires you to work your way up to campaign chair? Okay, I know you've asked that question now twice. Yeah. And I have to tell you very naively that I never felt I was working my way up. I, I just loved it. I loved being with the women. I loved their concepts of the women, that they were, you know, there wasn't any pettiness. I mean, everyone, it was if we had a common goal. And the, the positions happened, and I'm very appreciative that they happened. When I think about it now, it really was my, um, just my interest in my life. My, and it was a shared thing, as, it, as I've said before, with the family. So it was, it was very important to us. And what were your duties as campaign chair? Campaign chair uh, is very diversified. I mean, first of all, you, you want to bring, you want to inspire the women. You want to bring them into... Uh, into campaign. You want to really uh, set the best example you can and, um, you know, tell them the job that you want them to do. And then you have to, very honestly, uh, trust them to do it. And when you, you're working on campaign, there's so many facets. I mean, you might be planning uh, Super Sunday. You might be planning the megathons. You might be planning the uh, endowment aspect. You, you know, I mean, there would be um, there's just so much going on at one time. In fact, I had a great big notebook because you couldn't possibly put all the meeting dates and all the information into a telephone uh, um, you know, date thing. But um, something interesting happened, though. Um, when I became chair, it was 2002, and um, that was just the time of 9-11, if you remember. And, um, it was a very scary time in, in terms of contributions, and, and we had lost our uh, staff at that time, our, our uh, director, because the Federation had to you know, lay off several people. They were very worried. We were, we were very worried about funding, and um, because of that, we had no specific director, and a lot of the assignments were made to other personnel in different departments of Federation. So um, Nancy Grossfeld, who was president at the time, and I just think she is fabulous. She did a wonderful job. And, um, and I, as campaign chair, had to really organize and do a lot of the uh, more menial tasks. So it was really an encompassing, it was a, a very trying year. Happily, I can report that we, uh, we increased pledges and we raised almost $6 million. So I think it was pretty, pretty successful all in all. But it was, now we have wonderful, wonderful staff people, and um, I think that that has eased the, the burden somewhat. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about that because it really um, speaks so much to, to, your, um, to your skills. But in the middle of a recession and a scary time, you increased, we increased pledges. Increased. And how, how and why do you think that I, I, you know, something I don't know. It's quite an I'm accomplishment. Thankful. I'm thankful. I mean, we had wonderful women, women working uh, for us, and um, I think everyone was dedicated. And it was, it was a, you know, it was a very um, iffy time. You didn't know what was going to happen, but it was a successful campaign. I was very happy about that. And each campaign lasts a year. Yes. Well, that actually, I, I was in office for two years, so I had two campaigns. And then while you're, for example, while you're running the um, 2002 campaign, you still have a major catch-up with 2001, the, the, you know, the pledges you have to bring those pledges in, too. So it's, uh, it's encompassing. It's a job. So as successful as you have been. Yes, happily. And um, why didn't you become president? Oh, that's it the just question. Seems like a I thought about uh, this question a lot. Um, my husband and I were going to be spending the winters in Florida, and I honestly um, 
didn't feel I could do the job. You can't be in Florida and run a meeting and, and expect success. And if um, you're not there, things can go a different way than maybe you would hope, and then you're kind of left with it. And so I felt I could not uh, continue. Um, I had second thoughts about it, but every time I had a second thought, I came to the same basic conclusion. There were many qualified women who, uh, whom I knew could take over, um, so it wasn't a question of that. But um, um, I think for me, because of it, you know, I've had, I've, I've had regrets, but, but I did what I could do at the time, and, and um, I accept that. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that Nancy Grossfeld was the president yes. at the time. Were there any other mentors within mentors within um, women's philanthropy? Well, um, you know, I never felt that I was being mentored. I always felt that that it was just friendship and and really just just women who shared, as I've said before, the same goals. And when I became active, it was um, Edith Jack here. I may neglect to mention a few, but. Edith Jack Year or uh, Carolyn, Shirley Harris, Carolyn Greenberg, um, um, oh, Dulcie Rosenfeld, they, they were all leaders who were so inspiring and so lovely to work with and so encouraging that uh, I didn't feel anyone was directing me. It was just a, a very common goal sense, no question. Other than the the time, the 2001, 2002 time, what were the other challenges that you think you might have faced as campaign, or were there any other challenges as campaign chair? Well, I, I think that um, really it was the monetary, um, you know, just the fact that it was the recession and just the aftermath of 9-11. But um, there were just challenges along the way. There are many, many things to overcome. There are many, um, you know, there are problems that exist and you have to just be there all the time. <laughs> so it was a, it's a constant challenge. So this is good. I think this is going to be a hard question for you to answer, but what were some of your proudest accomplishments? Um, I think the fact, the ba very basic fact that I've alluded to already, that we ran a successful campaign, that it was like I was testing myself and I felt that I had, um, you know, met the challenge. Um, I think one of the things that I particularly loved, in, and I remember the year for this, 2010, uh, I received the um, American uh, uh, Fundraising Professionals Award. And that to me was very, uh, very important because I, it was almost as if the staff was acknowledging that, that I had, you know, I had done the job, so to speak. And I remember that event specifically because um, I was allowed to have a table and uh, um, a, a family, and I made sure that I had three of my young uh, granddaughters uh, who were um, not yet teenagers, and I wanted them to be part of my experience because they are, well, first of all, they're just such lovely young ladies. And I, you know, sometime I think, and I, I laugh about this, I'll tell my husband, I said, sometime I think that they see me taking them out for lunch, spending time with them now, and, and going shopping. And I just wanted them to see the other aspect of me, that what's really, really important to me. And so um, I'm really proud to say that my girls and my granddaughters have become involved with so many of their mitzvah projects. One granddaughter, Emma, goes to the um, um, you know, home for the age and goes to the mirror and, and meets with uh, some of the women and, and spends an afternoon with them. And my other granddaughter is so busy. Um, um, she went to the Ronald McDonald House, and, and she provides helps provide meals there for uh, parents of uh, you know children who are ill, and so they're they're just doing a lot of wonderful things now. And I, I think that you know sometimes you can talk about it, but when they're actually there and see what's happening, I think they're they're more into it and becomes it becomes real for them. Why is women's philanthropy important to you? Um, do, does it, how does it rank among, among maybe other 
philanthropic activities that you may or may be involved in or maybe you're not involved in yeah. any other ones? Well, I have been, as I indicated, but I think the you're asking specifically the women's. Mm -hmm. Well, Why I is think that, that vision so important? Oh, okay. I, I feel there's no question that it is. You know, when I was um, on the... Um, when I became campaign chair, I went on the campaign chair's mission. And uh, on that mission, there were so many interesting things that happened. Um, one was the fact that one, several young women who were part of the campaign and on that mission had, um, they were belonged to communities that had stopped a woman's um, um, campaign. And they felt by doing that, the communities felt that they weren't raising as much money. So these women were back starting up their women's campaign because they definitely felt that more money was raised once the women, you know, once the women had their own campaign and, and way of giving. Why do you think women um, raise money differently than men? Um, I do think that women have a little softer approach. Um, you know, I used to love to listen to my husband solicit because he always kept it light. And I, in my philosophy when I was, you know, campaign chair and for years before, it was just that. You can talk, you can meet with the um, person, the woman that you're soliciting. You can talk about the issues. You can um, make them aware of what's going on in the Jewish world and the needs and how great the needs are. But I think that um, you can set a goal, and if they say, no, they can't do it, you have to, to me, have to just sit back quietly and accept that. Because I think it's very important not to give women or anyone that you solicit an excuse. You don't want them to be angry at you and say, well, I'm not supporting the organization. I didn't like the way I was solicited. So to me, you never, ever want to do that. You don't, you don't want to give them an excuse for not giving. I feel that uh, uh, a softer approach, and maybe with that softer approach next year, they'll, they'll meet the goal that you have set for them. It might be just subliminally in their mind, I hope. <laughs> Always hopeful. <laughs> um, in your experience, how did the Women's Philanthropy Division interact with the general campaign? Mm. Well, I think in the early years um, that I was working, we would get together for Super Sundays and, and those major um, uh, community um, you know, telethons, and that worked. But I think through the years, as, as really the men have seen how much money women do raise, and that it's such an integral and such an important part of the campaign, I think that we have um, gained their respect, so to speak. And now, particularly since we've had Nancy Grossfeld and uh, Penny Blumenstein and now Beverly Liss as presidents, they've all come through the ranks of the women's uh, philanthropy. And I think because of that, um, there's no question, women are totally accepted in, in, in terms of the fundraising, no question. Do you think that's taken a long time? Taken a long time? Well, it's, it's a process, would you, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, why do you think it's, I mean, you sort of alluded to this, but maybe if you have something to add, if you don't, just say so. But why do you think it's important that women have their own campaign? Oh, I do. I do. I, well, first of all, for the additional dollars that are raised. But uh, something else happens. There are many women um, who, this women's department and women's philanthropy gives women a voice and there's so many times when uh, a woman, if she's at a general meeting, will not speak up. She'll let her husband take over. And I think that the importance of women to, women's uh, philanthropy is that it gives women a chance to voice their own views. Why for you, with everything you've told me and uh, you've reviewed in your life, why for you is philanthropy important? Well, I think it's the most integral part of Judaism that you could possibly want, isn't it? And, um, you know, I, sometimes I laugh about it, but um, the author, Isaac Bathsheba Singer, wrote a series of little uh, mysterious um, short stories. And in one of the short stories, he tells about a little 
bee that buzzes in your ear. And once that happens, you are forever Jewish. So that's the story, and that's me, and uh, philanthropy is just that much a part of me. <laughs> that's the only way I can answer that question. <laughs> what are your hopes for the WP um, division in the future? Just stay strong and keep moving. You're moving in the right direction, that's all. The women are terrific. The leadership is strong. And the beauty is that um, the women, you know, we change every couple years. And I think it's important to do that. And there seems to be, I mean, I never noticed pettiness. I have never seen that in the organization at all. Everyone wants the best for, uh, you know, to raise the money, to do the job. And, and I think that's one of the be beauties of it and that's kept me so closely tied to it because it's, it's giving new women a chance to experience leadership, and I think that's vital. And how often is leadership turned over? Well, every, you know, every, every year, lot of every lot, year. lot of things turn over every year. The campaign, well, the campaign uh, starts out with the associate campaign chair for two years, and then uh, two more years, and then if you go on, most other women have gone on to the presidency. So it is a long process. <laughs> It's a commitment. It's a commitment, most sure. Tell me about Argentina. Oh, okay. My husband and I went, um, we've, we've taken, you know, these missions are a life highlight. And I think that, that the fact that, um, the fact that we have uh, the missions are probably one of, one of the absolutely most important parts of Federation because it gives such a, uh, an experience in being with and doing some good. Well, we went to Feder we went as a federation group. There were actually we went with uh, uh, Shelley and Joel Tauber, and the, the four of us went as part of this national mission to find out what was going on in Argentina. And it was a difficult time because the um, uh, pesos and the and the dollars were um, being flown out of the country very rapidly, and uh, the the country was in was in a crisis. So we tried to come up with some plans to help, and I hope that we did. I think it was better for a while after that. But the thing that struck me about that mission that I, I think will always be seared into my mind is I remember talking to a very, very nice gentleman. And you know, the people, our Jews, were living on the streets. I mean, they were living on, because they had lost their homes. So you would see um, men and women in Armani suits dressed to the to the hill and no home and it was it was like an experience it was like the strangest experience for me and I remember meeting and talking to one very lovely gentleman who had been we were we had the um, evening at one of the synagogues and he um, had been on the board of the synagogue and now he was living on the street so it was a very difficult time for Argentina and I think many of the you know many of the people were helped by Federation and that was a good thing, but um, it was an experience to witness that. Very sad. Are there any other positions in, that you've held um, in Federation that you want to talk about? Any other positions? Well, I've held, you know, quite a few. I mean, I've been happy with them. Tell me how long the span of time has been that you've been involved with Federation. Well, my son was 50, 52 now. Uh, when I it went all the way through to 2004, when I ended my uh, you know campaign chair position, and now I'm a volunteer. I still uh, I still make some calls, and and uh, um, in fact I just talked to Amy Neistein this morning. She does a wonderful job, and she is the um, director for the women's uh, philanthropy now. So they have they have all that support staff, which I think is so important. But um, I hope I've answered your question. I've loved working. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Is there and anything? I have, well, very, very honestly, specifically, um, I've really, for the last, it's been 14 years since I've served as, as chair. Mm -hmm. So I keep going to the events and loving these young women taking over. <laughs> Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to say? Um, I did forget the name of the mission momentarily, the Prime Minister's mission, and that was uh, that's the one I referred to early on when we went to um, 
you know, when I met Kissinger after, that was the one that uh, was very, very, oh, pardon me, that was very important, and that was an ex very exciting. We went with our sons. Okay. Um, so if this, and it probably will, is to be used as a training video, at least in some par part, for another um, campaign share, is there any wrapped in a bow type of advice you would like to give to them, to that person? I think just do your best. Trust the people, as I've said, trust the people who are working for you. Know that they have the same goals that you do. And um, uh, just give it your best effort. It is a time-consuming job, but I think it's a labor of love. I think that's how most women feel about it. I did want to mention one thing mm -hmm. that um, I was not involved in this, but my um, two of my grandchildren have been, and it's called the Teen Board. And whoever came up with this idea, I think it's incredible. Um, they, they have a group of teenagers, high school students, our Jewish high school students, and Federation gives them an allotment of money, and with that, they can distribute the money, and they have they have the different agencies, whatever funds, wherever they want to um, allocate funds, they can do that. That is the money that they control. And I think it gives the kids such a beginning in terms of really, um, in, in terms of uh, being involved with uh, charities and being involved with really giving and, and having money and how important it is. So I'm very, you know, uh, very much into that. Both my granddaughters, Emma and, and uh, Isabel, now is serving on that committee, so it's very important. Other than that, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak and to kind of reminisce. You know, when you, when you have this uh, situation, I haven't thought about some of these memories in too long a time, and it's been heartwarming for me, and I thank you for the opportunity. Well, I'm glad they're all good memories. That is true. Certainly you've thank loved you. an impact on Federation and the people who it served, so thank you. Thank you.